All right, 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this rainy Monday morning. T.J. English is on the phone. He's a noted journalist, an award-winning screenwriter. He contributes to Vanity Fair, Esquire, Playboy, which I only look at for the articles. He's a screenwriter for NYPD Blue and Homicide and the New York Times bestselling author. His book is called The Corporation. It's an epic story of the Cuban-American underworld. T.J. English, good morning, sir. How are you? Good, good morning. Pleasure to be here with you. And where are you? Where are you calling from? New York City. All right. So how's the weather today? I, we, today's the day we get it bad, and you, you, you're getting a pretty good day, aren't you? It's beautiful spring weather, a little chill in the air, but it's very nice. Oh, nice. Well, th- thank you for being on the air with us. Tell us about the corporation. The corporation is the story of a criminal organization that existed from the mid-60s all the way to the end of the century. It was uh, comprised almost exclusively of Cuban-Americans, and even more specifically, the generation of Cuban-Americans who came to the U.S. in the wake of the revolution. Uh, uh, This was a group that uh, that formed uh, a criminal enterprise around the concept of what uh, Cubans call bolita, betting the number, the lottery, the illegal lottery. Yeah. Before the lottery was legal and run by states and federal government, it was illegal and it was run by organized crime. And it was a highly profitable criminal you know, racket. I don't intend to interrupt, but we we only know that as radio people because we do trivia. And in Florida, we have the lottery, and that's always a trivia question. What what gambling game preceded lottery? <laughs> and that's the name. Bolita? Yeah. 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 Well, it was it was run by a guy named Jose Miguel Battle, who's kind of a legendary, charismatic mob boss, um, who uh, oversaw the organization all the way from New York and New Jersey, Union City, New Jersey, all the way down to Miami. Wow! And, wow. and controlled everything in between. And what made made this criminal enterprise somewhat unique is. It was politically connected. It was uh, it was comprised of, of of some men who had taken part in the Bay of Pigs invasion and been held in prison in Cuba for a year and a half before they were released and they wow. came back to the United States. And they never gave up this dream of killing Fidel Castro and taking back Cuba. So even though it was a criminal enterprise, a gangster enterprise, they felt that it had this noble motive to reclaim the, the country they had lost. So uh, you, this is a number one book. I'm looking at it on on Amazon. You're doing really well with it. It's a number one release. Uh, when did it come out? It hasn't. It comes out tomorrow. It comes out tomorrow. Not out yet. How does that yeah. happen? And 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 in, you're number three in Hispanic American Studies. Number number four in Cuba category, and number five in the Caribbean and West Indies. Have you had a fascination with the uh, with Cuba and or the Caribbean for for a long time? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the reason this book is that high on the list is because I wrote a previous book called Havana Nocturne, which was about the era of the American mobsters in Havana in the 1950s, Meyer Lansky, Santo Traficante. Um, And that was a very successful book. And this book is almost kind of a sequel to that book, a follow-up to that book. It, It answers the question, what happened when all the mafiosi got chased out of Cuba when the revolution took over. And uh, your book has already been optioned for a film being produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes, that that happened very early in the process. You know, it's, it's, um, you've looked at the book, you might sense it's, it has a very cinematic feeling to it. It's kind of almost like the Godfather one and two together. Um, but even more interesting in the sense that there is this political context to it, I think that gives it kind of a, a socio-political weight to it that the average crime thriller might not have. And even though there is a lot of bloodshed in yes, the book, is. you still have uh, time for human relationships. Yeah, I try to. Uh, it's very important to me that the books that I write, even though that they're nonfiction and they're heavily researched and based on historical fact, um, I try to have the intimacy of personal relationships in there. And that, that requires finding people who live the story or maybe are one step removed from having lived the story and can and can give it to you in a firsthand way. And, and that makes it possible to 
draw the reader right into oh, the Oh, that's fascinating. Into the thing. So yeah. so it is it's a non-fiction book then. It's a non-fiction book. Yeah, it's what we call these days narrative nonfiction. So it's a nonfiction book that uses sort of no- novel writing techniques to tell the story. Uh, you know, uh, dialogue, reconstruction of scenes, so that it feels like you're reading a novel, really? but it's, so what, it's all heavily researched. So what was it like for you to, to sit down with the people that gave you the information, whether it was for the, the relationship part of the book or the, uh, or the, the, the mafia kind of stories? It's incredible. It's the best part of the whole process. It's when you're receiving the stories from the people who lived it and you're piecing it together. The most immediate, exciting part of that is when you're interviewing people and you're getting there and they're sharing with you their personal histories and their really? personal impressions and emotions and, and often traumas that have that occurred in their life. It's really quite a so how do you um, how do you gain their trust? Thing. How do you gain their trust? Just by being sincere and, and, and saying, Look, I'm not out to make you look bad, I'm not out to hurt you, I wanna hear your story. I you know, I interview killers and criminal people, but I, I make it clear to them that uh, if they're honest with me, I'll be straightforward with them. Uh-huh. And um, so far, I think I've established that reputation as someone who writes these kind of books. And I and I do get people on the other side of the law to talk to me quite a bit. Wow, the, the number one. Uh, I was trying to find the category. It's it's right in front of me. It's the biographies of organized crime. You're number one in that category right now. Do do you speak Spanish? I speak a little Spanish, yeah, enough to get down to Cuba numerous times and do interviews. Oh, wow. There's a uh, lot of money that changes hands also. Oh, this was a hugely profitable organization. We're, we're talking about millions of dollars on an annual basis and billions of dollars over the course of decades. You know, you wouldn't think that such a simple little thing as betting a number, yeah, right. a, three, a three-digit number would be so profitable but you know in in latin culture betting the number is almost like a religion um <laughs> little old ladies do it you know the local <laughs> priest does it local cops do it everybody does it so was the resistance to making gambling legal in florida and we still have some resistance to that but i'm just curious if our lottery maybe i don't know maybe because the rest of the country our lottery came in kind of late in the game most a lot of other states already had it but I'm yeah. wondering if our ele- elected officials said to themselves, you know, if we don't make it legal, they're gonna, it's going to be still illegal. It's still going to go on. Well, I think that's why they made it legal. There was money yeah. to be made. It was very profitable. And the state looked at it and said, if, if this thing is going to generate so much money, we should be getting a piece of it. Yes. Um, and and the, fear was, the fear was the violence surrounding it. Illegal gambling, you know, in and of itself... Uh, betting the number is a pretty benign, victimless activity. The problem was it, it became so profitable that, that you had criminals vying for territory. Greed took over, and, and greed is what created a very violent, a very violent world around the Bolita business. It's just amazing that, you know, the people would leave Cuba and smuggle themselves out to come here to the United States to build... A, a new life, but then crime and violence followed them, and there were always those who want to profit on what other people want to do legally. Yeah, and that's not exclusively a Cuban story, by the way. Uh-huh. Um, right, I, right. I write books. I've written a trilogy of books, nonfiction books, about my own Irish-American uh, culture and the, and the criminal history of the Irish-American underworld. I've written a book about a Vietnamese gang in Chinatown in New York. I've done a lot of journalism on different aspects of ethnic groups going through this process uh, in the United States. I've come to the conclusion that this this is the great American story. This is the story that almost all ethnic groups find themselves going through, especially when they first come to the United States. Yeah, I th- I, I'm, obviously this is going to be a, uh, a big movie for uh, the movie makers. Uh, and for you, I'm guessing it's going to be exciting. Hopefully they are true to the book. I have a copy of the book here. Um, T.J. English sent it to us, or somebody that he knows did. Uh, it's, co- <laughs> it's called The Corporation. <laughs> Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. I'd be glad to give it to one of you. The rest of us have to go buy it. I did find it on Amazon where it is doing well, even though it doesn't come out till tomorrow, right? Yes. Uh, um, so so uh, do you have a website you want to recommend? 
TJ Dash English. Um, yeah, you can you you can Google the name and you'll find a lot of different sources of information. I have a couple websites, and uh, yeah, you can purchase this pretty much anywhere, Amazon, any of the online outlets, or you can go into a store and get it. Okay, absolutely, go into a store. All right, yeah. let, let me give this one away real quickly. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Hi, this is Charles. Charles, do you know where we are? Yes, I do. When I was a kid, uh, I used to go to the corner uh, candy store where they took the numbers in Union City, New Jersey. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, Charles. The, oh, the, go. Thank you. The book will be waiting for you, okay? Gotcha, man. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that's one of those laws that even I would have broken, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, ever. Well, it's it's a, one of the laws that a lot of lawmakers broke. I mean, cops were yeah, notorious. I'm sure. They, I'm sure. they love to bet the number. And, you know, that created a kind of corruption that made it all possible. The cops were in on it. Local politicians got a piece of it. Yeah. Uh, everyone got a piece of it. It's really Bolita up in Union City, New Jersey. Bolita made the world go round. I bet it did. It only makes sense that it did. Uh, hey, th what a great topic. Uh, TJ English, thank you for being on the air with us today. Thanks for the time. I enjoyed You're it. You're welcome. We'll be right back. We all know the importance of good health, but we may not know the latest advances in medicine that are available to us. Monday at 9.05 a.m., Bern Paresa will be our roving medical reporter to tell us about Seven Hills Gastroenterology.